Hello, I'm Randy Sears, and I have the distinct privilege of introducing our speaker tonight. Many of you are familiar with Mr. Duncan. For those of you that this is your first introduction, let me give you a little background. Greg Duncan is one of the most highly respected leaders of our industry, someone so extremely successful that he has transcended every aspect of our business world. To give you a snapshot of his background, Greg Duncan has been an independent business owner for over 30 years. Mr. Duncan, along with his wife Lori, have achieved a rare combination of extraordinary financial success, better control of time, and most importantly, an exceptional family life. The mark of a true leader is not necessarily what he does, but who he brings behind him. Greg has personally mentored hundreds of world-class leaders in our industry. In addition, he sits on the board of an elite organization for independent business owners that empowers over half a million people a year to successfully develop their own business. He is also a chief advisor to a multi-billion dollar company doing business on and off the internet. As we know, wealthy people are not better than you or I. They just have access to different information, better information, and when they get it, they apply it. This is exactly the information that Greg will be sharing with us tonight. Please help me welcome Mr. Greg Duncan. Wow. Now I'm going to go home. I just want to remember that. Wow. Well, thank you, Randy. I appreciate it. It's, it's a thrill for me to be able to share the opportunity tonight to uh, discuss these important topics. And I want to talk to you tonight about financial stability in the 21st century. And I want to talk to you because this is about you. It's about your future. It's about financial stability in your life. Uh, you know, the financial world out there is changing. It's fa changing faster than any time in history. The rules are changing faster than ever. Traditional wisdom says that we need college educations to get best jobs, and graduates can't even find jobs, and those that can are usually underemployed. We're seeing entire industries disappear. They're being replaced by technology. Record and CD stores have given way to digital downloads. Video rental stores, they're hard to find anymore because we've got so many online movies. Bookstores are going to electronic books. Amazon.com, the biggest bookstore in the world, now sells more electronic books, they do all hardback and, and, and paperback combined. Newspapers and magazines are giving way to online information and Encyclopedia Britannica that published for 144 years announced in 2012 that they will no longer publish a hardback or softback encyclopedia because you can get better encyclopedias with more current information online. Now here's a critical question that affects all of us. How do we build a stable future in a world that's characterized by instability, when the only constant is inconsistency, when the only constant is change? Jobs are disappearing, companies are disappearing. Ironically, stability will demand flexibility. It's almost an oxymoron. So how do you find business concepts that flex with the technology and economy? That's what we're here to talk about tonight. Now, we've been taught all our life that we should climb the ladder of success. Unfortunately, we find that's leaning against the wrong building all too often. And, uh, you know, the results are disappointing. It's not what we wanted to. And so we talk about looking for an alternative, and people think, I put a lot of effort and time into that. I don't want to climb all the way down that ladder. Well, my advice to you tonight is don't climb down that ladder. Jump. <laughs> and run as fast as you can. This time, pay attention to where the ladder ends up instead of saying, oh, isn't that a pretty ladder? I like oak. That's nice. <laughs> Look at the end of the game, not the middle of the game. We're in the biggest revolution in our history. We're at a crossroads in history. It's a great time to be alive. It is an exciting time to make decisions for your family. You have a chance, like never before in history, to control your future as long as you will not cling to the past. Change is occurring so quickly that even those of you who are young, under 35, what you studied in high school and college is already overdue. It doesn't even apply anymore. That's how fast things are changing. We are in an economic revolution. We can change how we earn a living and how we live our life. But the goal is going to be this. It's going to be not how you make your money, but what kind of life we can lead from how we make our money. And that's thinking about things in a different way. You see all the technological changes. You see smartphones and satellites and internet and e-commerce. And these technologies empower the individual rather than entire industries. Every one of you are empowered like never in history. In the 1800s, we had an industrial revolution in this country. And those who owned the factories were those who created and held all the wealth. Well, now a factory is a computer connected to the Internet. Everyone in our great countries has access to their own factory. And now 
Financial independence, financial stability, and great wealth are within your grasp like at no time in history. Now, differences don't matter anymore. When we are empowered with our own factories like we are, with a computer connected to the internet, nobody cares what family you're born into. I don't care what race or sex or religion or age you are. Only the thing that matters is this. Are you ambitious? You have total control. Here's the good news. It's all up to you. Here's the really bad news. It's all up to you. <laughs> and you can be anything you want. There's no limits, but that also means there's no floor. You can decide to go nowhere if you want. If you're listening to this talk and you're ambitious, you like this kind of thinking. And uh, you want to do something great with your life, and I'll tell you, you can change the destiny of your entire family for generations to come like nobody in the history of your family has ever been able to do. We have never been at this point in history. We have an opportunity to think differently. We have an opportunity to think differently than anyone who's ever gone before us. Yet people who are thinking, 20-year-old thinking, already are totally off base. But the biggest thing that will hold us back is our own thinking and our thinking process. So my goal tonight is to talk about changing our mindset. My goal is not to sell you. My goal is not to convince you. My goal is to challenge you and the mindset that your brain uses to make decisions. My goal is to get you to be honest with yourself. So let's start thinking about where you're going. Where's your world going? Where's your life going? What should you be doing to make a living in a world that's changing so quickly? So our goal is to get you in a position to do one thing. Get control of your own life. Not just in money, but also in time. Because your life is valuable. Your family deserves to have control of their future. We base our success too often on how we do compared to our neighbors. Well, I'm doing better than anybody else in my cul-de-sac. Well, if your neighbors aren't succeeding, you're comparing yourself to mediocrity. A lot of our neighbors are, are more limited than we are, and they live the similar life to what we do, and we don't want to compare that. Thinking that that's success because you're doing better than them is like two guys jumping out of an airplane, both without parachutes. <laughs> And you're excited because he went first. He's going to hit the ground first. That is the <laughs> stupidest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> Failing second is not succeeding, for goodness sakes. <laughs> fighting not to lose is not where it's at. It's not the same as fighting to win. It's not good enough just to be better than you can't stand. You should be demanding excellence out of every part of your life. You have the right to. You have the ability to. You have the access to. And in my opinion, you have the obligation to. If you don't pursue excellence, <laughs> if you don't pursue excellence, mediocrity will pursue you. I don't know if you've ever heard of a guy named Jim Collins, highly respected business analyst. He's an advisor to several major CEOs. He's a best-selling author of some phenomenal books called Built to Last, Good to Great, just to name a couple of them. He poses a very profound question. He said, if you had $200 million in the bank, and he picks that number because it would cover most of your dreams. You know, um, Most people don't have dreams that big. Some of you say, I want to give $2 billion to the United Nations. Well, that's great. But let's be constructive and think of actually what would you do with every dollar. Let's say $200 million would cover some pretty, pretty amazing dreams. And he says, let's add a second thing. Besides having $200 million, let's say you had five years to live. Wow. All of a sudden, you're going to focus, aren't you? What would you do with your life? That's what he proposes. If you're, would, would, you, would you change anything? If your answer is, I would change everything. You know what you just said? You aren't doing anything you wish you were doing. Do you understand how profound that is? You really want to be living a life that way? Don't go through life like that. Life is too important. You're too important to not be doing anything that you really want to do. Most of us have two lives, the life we live and the unlived life within us. You want to live the life you really want to live. Start making decisions accordingly. Now, that means you're going to have to change. We've been talking about that all night, doing things that are different, that are unusual, and that's uncomfortable for people. You're going to have to learn how to do some things you don't know how to do yet. We're never going to ask you to do anything an eighth grader can't do, but a lot of you can't do some of that stuff, so you're going to have to be willing to try. <laughs> and change is uncomfortable. You know, we, we don't like change. We are very stubborn creatures. But, but we've got to start doing things because they're right, not because they're comfortable. We need to start making changes now. Quit waiting until your world is perfect or your you're forced to make a change. Make changes now when you have the time to get it right because it's the right thing to do. I have a great friend who I admire terrifically. He's a professional athlete, a revered business coach um, named Tracy Eaton. He has my highest respect, and he says, if you want a great prize, <laughs> some of you know him, incredible person. If you want a great prize, it will take a great price. Too many people say they want the prize, but they just refuse to pay the price. The greatest risk in life is to risk nothing. 
So if we're going to make changes, what changes would those be? I mean, if you could change and do anything you wanted your, with your life, what would you do? You know what happens is a lot of you don't get creative enough. You just say, well, I don't want anything different. I just want it bigger. Like, I want a watch. I just want a nicer watch. I want my kids to go to school. I just want them to go to a private school. I want a house. I just want a bigger house. I want a car. I just want, you know, a nicer car. Well, what if you could erase the, the board and, and rewrite your life? What if, what if you could think about whole new things? What if you could wipe the slate clean? Instead of making the print bigger, you could put down a new print. I mean, get creative and rethink your entire life. Use nobody else's standards. Create your own. You know, uh, you don't ever have to like the things Lori and I do, but the point is that you're free to do whatever you want. And Lori and I have is probably our biggest mission in life is to raise great children. And we consider that a big obligation. We've, we've dedicated our lives to raising our children, raising better citizens, training them to become adults. We've always said we never raised children. We raised adults who are going through childhood, and they become our best adult friends, better than anybody else that we've ever known. And we think that education is incredibly important for our kids, so that was a big thing for us. Now, we, we always liked education for the sake of education, not for the purposes of finding employment. That was never it. We love education. We love reading and learning and expanding, because you expand your perspective to look at the world in more insightful ways. So our goal was to have our children experience education, involved in real-life situations so they could see what life was really like. So we took our children out of our private school that we had at many times, took him to Europe, took him to Hawaii, took him to different countries around the world, took him to Boston to walk the Freedom Trail where Paul Revere lived. They learned more actually walking the trail and see where Paul Revere lived than they did trying to memorize something for a test. And I'm the one that got called into the principal's office. <laughs> and he, get, he points his finger at me and lectures me going, Greg, your children are missing too much school. They're not sitting in a classroom. He said, yeah, but they learned this stuff. They did phenomenal on the test. I mean, they, they lived it. They just didn't memorize it. They actually know it. They can explain things to you that you don't know about Paul Revere. He says, that doesn't matter. They have to be sitting in that chair a certain number of days a year or we can't move to the next grade. And I said, why not? He said, we won't get our federal funding. <laughs> so we bought a school. <laughs> well, we called the shots. There were two students at our school. <laughs> It had two amazing teachers. They had multiple degrees, multiple languages. They, they, and they made outdoor activities and projects, adventures and teaching when our children learned languages. We took them to foreign countries. You know, I, I found out that when you take Spanish two days a week for 45 minutes, you just don't get it with Senor Hernandez. <laughs> Like you do if you take your children down to Costa Rica and live there for six weeks in a row and immerse them in a, in a culture in a, in a town where nobody speaks English and they're forced to speak Spanish or they can't eat, they can't even go find a bathroom unless they speak Spanish. And guess what? They learn it really quickly. <laughs> and more importantly, they're immersed in another culture where they started to appreciate the commonality of all persons. Came to France and French and we lived in the French Riviera for a long period of time. And it's not just about education, it's fueling our kids' passions, you know? We don't ever say, well, we couldn't afford it. We, we pursue incredible passions when our kids were excited about things we funded those passions where, where would you be if your parents had fueled every passion you had encouraged you to take it to the extreme all they ask is that you pursue it to a level of excellence because it'll develop character you learn how to navigate the world when you go after passion that's all I wanted for my kids I didn't care what they ended up doing you know my daughter pursued a horseback ride and my son pursued different things I didn't care if they ended up doing that I just wanted them to pursue it with passion while they did and it made them better for the next thing they pursued and the next thing they pursued and that's what I wanted to do a very good friend of mine and a, and a leader oozing with wisdom is a guy named Dean Whalen. He lives up in Canada. And I love this statement he says. He says, once you have seen an opportunity to get free, you no longer have the privilege to take advantage of it. You now have the responsibility to take it. And I love that. So... We need to start focusing on what's important. And you do that first by stop focusing on things that aren't going to make a difference. Just start writing down things as important as what's the most important thing going to impact where I'm going to be two to five years from now. And then when you run out of time, you stop doing the things on the list. And that way you get the most important things done first. Now, I know you're going to be scared of a lot of this stuff. If you're going to think outside the box and make yourself uncomfortable, you're going to be afraid. You know, our son became an Eagle Scout at a young age and took the Scout Oath. And brave is one of the words in the Scout Oath. And his, and his Eagle Scout hearing, he was required to explain all the words in the in the Scout Oath and, and got to Brave and we were reviewing it and both Devin and I thought that means that uh, you're not afraid. Well, the, the Scout book pointed out correctly to us that that's not what Brave means. It doesn't mean you're not afraid. It means that even when you are afraid, you still do the right thing. And that's what brave people do. They're not extraordinary people. They're ordinary people who make extraordinary decisions. 
So here's our goal, to talk about the ability to have flexibility, adapt to changes in the world, having choices to pick your direction like never before. So let's talk first about this, not what do you do to make a living, but why do you do what you do to make a living? That's a different question than most of us are asked. A lot of people want to figure out what they're going to do to make a living. And so, well, let's find out why you want to make a living first. Where do you want to end up? Remember the ladder leaning against the wall? Find out where it's going to end up first. So I ask you, why do you do what you do? Now, a lot of people don't like talking about this stuff. I don't like talking about money, you know. Well, guys, you're going to spend more time in your life pursuing an income to try to just survive than you will do any other single thing in your life. So you need to have this discussion. Whether you like me or like me talking about it or not does not take away the importance of this topic. It's the most critical topic you can do, just evidenced by where you're spending the majority of your time. Most of your hours in your days are spent preparing for work, going to work, coming back from work, you know, eating to get prepared for work or going to bed again so you can do it again. You know, punctuated by a couple hours of online video gaming or watching TV, whatever you do with your time. And I would tell you that you need to come to some decisions with this. And so let me tell you something that's going to contradict tradition for you right up front, something that's going to offend some of you. I do not think you should pick jobs or professions or careers because you like them. I think you should pick them because they make the most amount of money in the shortest period of time so that you can go live the lifestyle you want with the people you love. And I know that defies traditional thinking and steps on your toes because some people think they're supposed to find fulfillment at work. Well, I say find fulfillment in your family and the things you love doing, not in your cubicle. Yeah, I would shovel horse manure, I, and I picked that because that's the most disgusting and demeaning job I can think of. When my daughter was riding horses, she thought it was awesome. I never got that, but, <laughs> but that's the most disgusting and demeaning job I can think of. I would shovel horse manure if I could make three times the income on a third of the time. That's an easy decision for me. Versus a nice office, tall building, social status. I don't want status from what I do. I want status from what I get from what I do. And I would shovel horse manure to triple my income and triple the time available to me. Let me give you an example. Average incomes in America. The average two-income family in America makes a little over $60,000 a year. The top 15% of people in America make $100,000 a year. I'm sorry for you Canadians. I'm not sure exactly what the statistics are. You look sharper than us, so I'm sure you're richer. But in the United States... <laughs> eh? But if, if your incomes are somewhere between the sixty and $100,000, and if you work an average of 40 to 60 hours a week, like by far the majority of people do, I'm asking you, if you could increase in income, and that increase in your time, would you shovel horse manure? Well, I don't have to think about it. I say yes to that in two seconds. If you have to think about this, turn off this recording and go home, because this is not for you. <laughs> this is the simplest decision in the world. There is no status from any occupation in the world that is more important to me than spending time with the woman I love, my wife, and the kids that we have, and the life we have together, and I would shovel horse manure in two seconds to do that. Too many people live to work instead of working to live. And if your living becomes your life, I will promise you, you are missing out on life. Being fulfilled at work? Why don't you work at being fulfilled at your kitchen table? Work at being fulfilled in your backyard playing soccer with your kids. I pray that's where your priorities are. I pray for your family that's where your priorities are. Have you ever noticed that, that when people ask you about yourself, they say, well, what do you do? And you know what they mean. But what's sad is that people define themselves by what they do for an occupation. They didn't say that. They didn't say, what do you do for work? What do you do for an occupation? What do you do to make money? They just say, what do you do? And so people answer by their occupation. Oh, I'm an accountant, I'm a lawyer, I'm an engineer, or whatever. Oh, I love when people, you know, I'll ask somebody, what do you do? And they'll answer with an occupation. And they ask me, what do you do? And I say, wow, that's a lot of things. I, I love to spend a lot of time with my family and friends. I travel, I play tennis, I mountain bike. I, have, I love water sports. I love to attend concerts. I love attending pro sporting events. I love to spend time with my mentors and entrepreneurs at beaches around the world, golf courses around the world, shopping around the world, cruises around the world. I love to attend seminars with world-class experts on cutting business edge concepts or economics. Were, were you looking for something in particular? Or? <laughs> So define your life by how you live, not on how you make a living. People talk about taking pride in their occupation. I don't have a problem with that. I hope you take pride in everything you do. You know, I hope you're the best horse manure shoveler we have ever met and proud of it. And you got the cleanest shovel at the end of the day. That's awesome. <laughs> But the problem is, is when your occupation starts to dominate your life and all your decisions and your family has to sacrifice for it. That's where I've got a problem. When it starts to define your life, when somebody says, what do you do? And you name your occupation, and that truly is what you do. That's your life. 
And I encourage you to think differently about that. Um, it's it's, it's uh, important to define your life by your life, not your occupation. Somebody say, well, what will my friends think? I'll tell you what they'll think. Wow, you're the richest horse manure shovel I've ever met. That's what they're going to think. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that the people that are hung up the most on what you do can't afford to live in the neighborhoods that one day you're going to live in? Have you ever noticed that? We live in the third richest zip code in America, and I am fascinated by what my neighbors do for a living. What fascinates me most is none of their occupations are exciting or impressive, but their results are very impressive. I love it. You know, we're all taught that one day we're going to have to go out, make a living, go to school, get a good education so we can get good grades, so we can go out and get a good business of our own job. <laughs> Yeah, isn't that amazing? Hey, look, I don't mind that they teach you jobs. I hope if you want a job and you want to find a job, an occupation working for somebody else, and you're happy and they take good care of you and you're thrilled, God bless you, that's great. But shouldn't they also be teaching us the other option about having a business of their own? And I don't know what school you went to, but my school system never taught that. And because of it, I think we think there's no other occupation. And the reason they do that is because they're trying to focus on the mechanics of what you do. So they always talk about what you do, you know? Oh, you're good at math, you should be an engineer. Oh, you're good at science, you should be a doctor. Um, you know, we ask 18-year-old boys in high school, what they want to do. Seriously? <laughs> Have you met 18-year-old boys? You're going to ask an unregulated bag of testosterone what he wants to do with the rest of his life? Uh, let's see, do I get to choose anything? How about drink beer, chase girls, and drive fast cars? Does that pay well? Uh, let me give you a big hint. No, it doesn't pay well. It's very expensive. See, my biggest problem with that is that we're teaching people the wrong question. We're teaching them to look at what they do rather than why they do it. And, and the problem is when you pursue something because you think you're going to like the process, you think you're going to like the what of it, I got some bad news for you. It's going to grow old really fast. I mean, all those of you who've gone out and gotten a job or an occupation or a profession that you thought, if some of you trained for professions for over a dozen years. And how long did it take before you stopped looking forward to Mondays and started looking forward to Fridays? Some of you are thinking, I think I got over that in the first week. Um, <laughs> I mean, think about it that way. You know, if you're going to make a decision for 40, 50, 60 years of your life, you know, uh, you better be something more than just liking it because you're not going to like it that long. It has to be for a different reason. And so I think we're teaching the wrong question. I, I think that we need to, to look at different ways because what happens is people get frustrated. Now they don't like it anymore. Then they pay attention to the fact that, oh, it didn't get me what I was looking for either. It didn't give me the life I want. So now I need to start over. Well, they're only taught one thing. Go find what you like to do. Well, I don't like to do that anymore. So, not. so they haven't prepared them for what to do next. So I've got to tell you, if you're you're listening tonight, this is a difficult thing to do because you've never been prepared to say, if I'm not satisfied where I am, how do I start all over? Well, we're going to talk about a lot of that tonight. Um, we want to talk about first is asking a different question. Instead of, what do you think you'd like to do? Why would you like to do it? Whatever you're going to decide to do, let's decide why you want to do it first, and here's how you decide what you want to do, uh, or why you want to do something. You, you set some goals. Write out the kind of lifestyle you'd like to have two, five, and ten years from now. What do you want to do? If you don't know where to start, well, what do you do on Mondays now? What would you like to be doing on Mondays? You know, If you had your choice, what would you like to be doing on Tuesdays? What would you like to be doing on Wednesdays? Do the seasons. What do you do in spring now? What would you like to be doing every spring? What would you like to be doing every summer? If you could have your dreams of two and five and ten years from now, what would you like to be doing in the fall and the winter? My guess is it might be slightly different than what you're doing now. And, and that's how you sit down and figure that out. And that's what I encourage you to do. But most people aren't taught to do that. You know, you've got to find out if you've got some emotional maturity. Here's what we ought to be teaching people when they're getting ready to establish careers or picking the way they're going to make money the rest of their life. Learn delayed gratification. Learn that, that short-term rewards don't necessarily always give you the long-term rewards. And you've got to mature enough to understand that I'm willing to work hard and sacrifice to have something for the long period of time. You're never going to get anything great for the rest of your life if you're not willing to put your nose to the grindstone. But look where the ladder ends up first. Don't put your nose to the grindstone because you like the tread on the ladder. Look at the end of the ladder, okay? Now some people will say, well, I don't care about all this money stuff. You're just talking about money. I just want to help people. Really? And how do you propose to do that, dear tell? You know, um, everything I've ever seen to help people, we love helping people. It takes a lot of money to help other people. And so those of you who want to, I don't want to make money, I just want to help people. Well, let me promise you this, I don't even know what you're picking and I can tell you right away, you're going to find yourself extremely limited. You're going to spend 95% of your time begging other people for money because you don't have it because you refuse to make it. And, and somebody else is going to have to fund your passions. The truth is that helping other people takes more money than any materialistic dream anybody could come up with. I'm for you. I think it's great. But I've told my pastors and all the leaders of the organizations I'm a part of, I don't want to be on your committees. 
I don't need to sit and philosophize with people what we do if we don't have money, but we really don't have money. Just come to me, I'll take you out to lunch, tell me your projects, give me a choice, I'll pick some and write your check and we're done and I'll move on, okay? I'll make a deal, I'll make the money, you come up with the projects, I'll fund them, here we go. That's easy, that's the shortest committee meeting I've ever been to. I like those kind of meetings. <laughs> Oh, some of you don't like that. You know, some, some problems take more than just money. Yeah, you're right. I know. Like, what does it take? Well, it takes time to sit down and talk through things with people. And why haven't you taken that time? Well, because I'm going to work all day. Oh. <laughs> so if you had money to solve 95% of your problems and had a bunch of time left, you could actually solve all the non-money problems. So in reality, money solved all your problems, right? <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought, too, before you started arguing with me. <laughs> The greatest charity in the world is to eliminate the need for charity by teaching self-sufficiency. You know, one of the challenges we're going to have as you approach this, you're going to say, yeah, but I'm busy. I don't have time. It's probably going to be the biggest obstacle you have about climbing off your current ladder because most people don't have 15, 20 hours a week sitting around like, man, thank God you came along because I just had this big hole in my schedule and I needed to fill it with something. <laughs> If you know that person, I haven't met them yet. Um, you know, most people are working five, six days a week or more, eight, ten hours a day or more. Uh, add in some commute time. Here's, here's my question. Let's evaluate the ladder you're standing on. Would you do it again? If you know what you know now and had the choice to go back, regain your youth, but keep your wisdom and experience, would you do it all again? Better yet, would you recommend it to your children? Um, that, that's a big question. Um, and so and, and if the answer is no, then, then what are you still doing on the ladder? If you wouldn't do it again and you don't recommend it for them, then why, do you, why are you still sitting on the ladder? Um, some of you will say, well, because of all that, I just don't have time. Look, you didn't have time to do 40 hours a week before you started work either, but you found it, didn't you? <laughs> Look, if you can give eight hours a day to your boss's business every workday, why can't you give two hours to your own business? I am more interested in working two hours for myself than I am working eight hours for somebody else. And if I can go work eight hours for somebody else in their dream, I know, no matter how tired I am, no matter what else I've got, I can find two hours a day for myself. Now, um, I didn't want to have to think about this kind of stuff. A lot of you don't want to have to be this complex. I just want it to be simple. I just, you know, I just wanted to find something that sounded fun to me and I wanted to do. So I just wanted to pick an occupation that sounded like I'd enjoy it. Well, I wish the world was that easy. Wouldn't that be nice? I mean, the economic analysis most of you do is, well, I'm not sure how much it costs to live and I'm not sure how much I'll make, but you have this financial analysis that says this. Well, I think I'm going to make a certain amount of money and I'm sure life will cost a little less than that, so I have a little fluff left over. Okay. Let's do your economics. How's the fluff coming? Because <laughs> my guess is you're making this amount of money, life costs more than what you're making, and you have a headache every, at the end of every month. And that's not fun. So look, I, I'm not trying to get control of, of, of my life because I'm a control freak. I'm just trying to stop letting everybody else control my life. You know, when you don't have an occupation that you can make those choices, I'm not trying to be trite. That's the solution to those. I was having a discussion with somebody the other day, and I go, well, what do you do if this goes up and that goes up? So, make more money? Why is that a difficult question? Well, if you're in a vehicle that doesn't allow that, that's a very scary option. Well, do we need to do the ladder talk again or do you get this? Okay? <laughs> so look for one that gives you what you want to do. That's why you jump off the ladder and uh, that's just very different. I mean, it, it, jumping off the ladder, that means that all your friends are going to see you drastically do something different. You may not be showing up for Friday night drinking club anymore <laughs> and Saturday and Sunday and Monday. I, you know. <laughs> And, and, and some of you are worried about what everybody else is going to think. Well, I, I, you've got to ask yourself the question. Are you living for your friends, your neighbors, and coworkers? Don't you teach your children all the time when they come home and tell you about this situation at the playground? Doesn't one of the first thing you say is, stop worrying about what Bobby thinks. Stop worrying about what Billy says. Yeah, you are. Well, listen, get in front of a mirror and give yourself the same lecture. You need to make decisions that are right for your family, not what everybody else thinks. Real friends will not chastise you or talk behind your back. Real friends will say, you know, you're nuts. You're crazy doing this, but I love you and I'm your friend and I want you the best you can be so go for it man and if you do have a bunch of friends who aren't excited remember this sanity is not statistical <laughs> the number one regret of people dying in hospices is this I wish I had had the courage to live a life true to myself not the life that others expected of me don't waste till your last breath of air to realize that this is a truth now, some of you are offended by all this focus on money because you're, you're, you're talking about, you know, well, I love what I do and I just don't do it for money. Are you really being honest with yourself, truly? Because if they stopped paying you, you wouldn't stop showing up? <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, you, they stop paying you and let you go, and a lot of you don't have a job anymore, and you're going, oh my goodness, I can't show up there anymore. I go, what happened? Didn't you go and tell them you have a love affair with your job? Didn't you go and tell them that, you, that you'd work without money? You know, I was trying to be, they said, well, Greg, you've got to be practical. I was trying to be practical. You're the one that lipped off and told me you did it out of love. I don't believe you. I think you do it for money. <laughs> Just go back and say there's been a misunderstanding. I'm not here for the money. I'm just here for the aura of the whole thing. <laughs> what's, what cracks me up is I run into some of these people two years later. They have a whole different occupation. I said, well, I thought you loved your old situation. Yeah, but I got a raise. But it's not about the money. Okay. <laughs> Look, it's okay if you lie to, your, to me. Okay, it's all right. But just don't lie to yourself. Okay, just be honest about what you're really trying to do so you can make some decisions that make sense. I'm not confused about the truth. Just make sure you aren't, Okay. Let's go to the situation, though, even if you do love what you do and they're adequately compensating you and you got the time you want, it's really terrific. i got to tell you, even with all that, I still think you're being foolish because you're tempting fate. Somebody else holds the puppet strings to your life. What law prevents you from being laid off in your state? If a boss has to decide between you and him because finances are tight, are you confused who he's going to pick? <laughs> Let me give you a clue. It's not you, okay? You say the wrong thing to the wrong person and they could destroy your entire financial future? How do you sleep at night with that kind of thing? I mean, even if you do what you like to do, even if they compensate you, you're foolish not to get into a vehicle where you pull the purse strings, you take things into your own hands, and you control where you want to go. Doing what we can or even what we like is not necessarily what we should. And if you don't pursue your dreams, you're going to work for someone else pursuing theirs. You live in the freest countries in the world. You're surrounded by technology. It opens up opportunity and choices. How ridiculous is it to be restricted in the 21st century by someone else controlling your life? Let me give some statistics of self-employment and what's happening and how many people are choosing to be self-employed rather than employed by someone else. In the years 2000 through 2011, the first decade of the 21st century, 99% of employment increase came from self-employment. According to the Bureau of Economic Analysis, U.S. Department of Commerce, government employment grew 1.36 million. Private employment during that decade decreased by 1.26 million. That's a net increase in jobs working for other people of 105,000. Self-employment during that same time grew by 10.7 million new sole proprietors. That's 99% of all the employment increase that took place in that period of time. Politicians are, are worried about increasing jobs. Why? Go to work for yourself. Here's the best part you probably won't fire yourself. That's awesome. <laughs> There's a lot of people that are saying in the near future, oh, in the next five, ten years, um, over half the people in this country will be self-employed. So if that's where we're going to go, then you want to be involved in a business that not only does that, but offers the opportunity to share it with others. Here's another mindset we need to look at. When people ask, how much do you make, what do you say? A lot of people quote their gross income. But I would ask you, is what you bring in really what you make? Look at yourself like a corporation. If you were a corporation, you Inc. How would we look at you? Compared to buying a stock in a major corporation like General Motors, one of the largest corporations in the world, at the end of the first decade of the 21st century, General Motors ran $150 billion. Is it proper to say General Motors made $150 million? Well, of course not. They didn't make what they brought in. They had to pay out a lot of things. They had a lot of expenses. They have thousands of subcontractors, raw materials, steel, aluminum, rubber, polymers, etc. They have employees. They have factories, energy bills, what, uh, dealerships, advertising, uh, TV. TV, magazines, spring events, the net income is what's left over after all of that. Is it possible, can you even conceive of a number this big, to bring in $150 billion and literally have expenses that match or exceed that? Could you literally make no money bringing in $150 billion? Yeah, well, General Motors has proven that before. <laughs> in fact, there are companies that can lose billions. If a company consistently wasn't making money, no matter how much they brought in, if they consistently at the end of the day were left with no money, would you buy that stock? If you don't understand finances, the answer is no, you would not, okay? Well, let's go back to you, Inc. How much do you make after you take out all your expenses? Quit counting the gross. Take out your rent or house payment. Take out your car payment, your fuel, your food, your child care, your medical care, etc., etc., etc. How much is left for most people in America? It's less than zero. For the remainder, it's about zero. Or they maybe have some meager retirement savings, which cracks me up. It means they're going to try to live on less than they struggle to live on now. I don't understand that logic or math. <laughs> and here's the bad news. You're living longer. Sorry to tell you that. Ouch.
<laughs> so should I buy stock in you, Inc.? With, with that kind of financial report, would you suggest I buy stock in you, Inc.? And if the answer is no, then what are you doing buying stock in you, Inc., for goodness sakes? Quit faking yourself out. You don't make what you gross. You make what's left over after everything is finished. And if that number is low or zero, you've gained almost nothing. The ROI, there's a big economic term for it, your return on investment, if you put in 2,000 hours a year, that's 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year, and you, at the end of the year, after everything is paid, taxes, everything else, you're left with $2,000, you made a buck an hour. Wow. And you also just kept more money than most Americans. <laughs> if you have $10,000, you made five bucks an hour. Now look, I believe in low-paying jobs. I, I don't have a problem with them because they're temporary bridges to independence, but they're not the solution financial security. It's nothing, you are gonna live a life of survival on the edge. And what happens is most people are working so hard to survive in the short term that they're missing the opportunity to prosper in the long term. So let me ask you again, if you'll work eight hours a day for your boss's business, could you find your way clear to spend two hours a day on your own future and your own business? Absolutely. That just makes sense to me. But what about things beyond survival? I mean, have you ever thought about life beyond survival of just getting by? I mean, what if you have a surplus that you can hardly count? Think about future, opportunities, old age, children, grandchildren, the bumps and catastrophes of life. Welcome to life. You will have problems. You will have catastrophes. Historically, these wipe out families for generations. Now, you know that. It happens. You see it happen to your friends. Don't just look at other people what's happening to them. Oh my gosh, look what happened to the Johnson family. Johnson's nothing. It's going to happen to you. It's only a matter of time before some catastrophe happens in your family. And, and you can be complacent and let it happen and they go, oh great, you wouldn't believe what happened. We didn't see it coming. Are you listening? It's coming. It's only a matter of time. Quit worrying about the Johnsons or the Smiths or whoever. It's going to happen to you. I have a very dear friend, a world famous mentor, teacher, and multimillionaire named Ron Perer, he said, dig your well before you're thirsty. For you to say I didn't think it's coming and it wasn't our fault, yes it was, and shame on you. Now here's the problem. The problem is, we're, well, most of us are paid by the hour, and, and we're, we're taught to think about getting paid by the hour, and the problem is we're limited with that, because there's only so many hours in a day. There's only 24 hours in a day. Last time I checked in with God, he wasn't granting any more, so we're stuck. And you got to stick stupid stuff in there, like sleeping, eating, going to the bathroom, all that kind of stuff, so you're limited. Even if you get raised to a salary, I mean, you know, you guys have figured that out, right? Oh, I got a promotion, and I got a raise to a salary. Well, when your salary goes up 10%, and your hours go up 30%, I don't know if you've done the math, but your per hour income went down. The joy of that doesn't take long to, uh, to wear off real quick. And no matter how hard you work, you're going to reach a ceiling. There's only so much you can do. I, I started realizing this when I was very young, putting myself through college as a construction laborer. I got paid by the hour. I've never loved unions so much as when I was 18 years old is I got paid the same exact amount as the guy who worked with me as another construction laborer who was 50 years old and mentored me and taught me what to do. I certainly wasn't worth what he was. You know, he was way better than I was, could work three times as efficiently as I did, but thank God for the union, I got paid the same amount of money. And I spent my money on things like cars, fun, and girls. He spent his money on girls. He had three of them in college and had a mortgage. And it finally dawned on me one day, you know, I don't want to be 50 years old one day and have some punk match my income after 32 years, I have nothing to show, and I only get paid if I show up with that same punk and make the same money he did. I didn't tell you, that didn't fire me up. You realize if you've been working for on a pay, per hour basis or salary income, no matter how much you made last year, you start all over this year. You don't get paid a dime this year for what you did last year. You have to redo it every single year. And I say, stop trading your time and learn how to invest your time. You know, I went on to medical school and I found out that medicine really wasn't that much different than being a construction lady. Well, you wear a little bit different uniform, and you're still paid by the hour. Well, that's not true. You're paid by the surgery, but the surgery takes a certain number of hours, and so I guess you kind of get paid for the hour. But you're less flexible than ever before. You're enslaved by your patients. They don't get sick on a schedule, sadly. And, and uh, my, you know, sure, I could get paid more money, and my family can enjoy a lifestyle, but I can't. The patients don't go, you know, it's time for Dr. Duncan to have a vacation. Why don't we take a vacation from being sick? It doesn't work that way. And I could probably have some of the doctors take my patients, but that's the problem. They take my patients, and they don't give them back, so 
though in reality you don't have the freedom you want. You know, the ideal dream occupation would be this. Because ideally you just want to stay home with your family, right? I mean, I just love to stay home with my family. The problem is staying home with your family breaks my heart because they starve because nobody's bringing in any money. <laughs> So you run into the paradox of life, the catch-22 of life, the, the oxymoron of life, the teeter-totter of life. I'd rather be home, but I've got to leave home to make money because I love my family so much that's at home. So you have to leave for the very people you don't want to leave because you love them so much. And then you bring back food and water, and you know they get greedy and want more, and now they want meat and potatoes, and so now you get to go back and work harder, and then they want shelter, and then they want, you know, and, and you want opportunity. I mean, I, we would give our life for our children, you know, we want more opportunity for them. And you get the teeter-totter of life, so you're spending more time than you ever conceived to be with from your family more because you love your family the most. What if you could have both options together? Wouldn't it be great if you could stick your face in a photocopy machine, make 10 of you, send them to do the, most of the work, and you spend more time at home, have more income and more time at the same time? Well, you can't do that. Some employers think they can. Some employers say, well, I've duplicated myself. I have employees. Really? Those employees match you. They're just as excited as you. They're just as disciplined as you. They care just as much about the business as you do. They come early as you and stay as late as you. And if the business is tight, they say, hey, we don't need any money for the next six months because we're investing in the business. Yeah? <laughs> try, try skipping payroll one time and you'll have a revolt on your hands, for goodness sakes. <laughs> You know, you, if you got employees, let me tell you, they are not as driven as you. It's not because they're less competent. They're not getting paid what the owner is. They, they, why should they care as much? Here's the point. It's not their business. And when you put all the money at the top to the owner and don't share it with them, they aren't going to be as excited as you. So that doesn't work either. So what are you going to do? You know, you've got to change your traditional employment concept of working for somebody else. You've got to change that concept or you're never going to get out of it. Some people keep doing the same thing over and over and over and trying to get a different result. You know, and they, that's, that's what they say the definition of insanity is, right? Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. If you want to do, have different results, you've got to do something different. So there's a fabulous, incredibly successful guy you've got to, you've got to read about, learn about, hear about, a guy named Robert Kiyosaki. Because he said it's not what you do, but why you do it. What are we going to talk about all night? This guy is incredibly successful. He's a, he, makes, he has multiple businesses. He makes millions per year. He's written several books about it. Most of you know about the famous book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Talks about four quadrants in a chart, ESBI, employment, solo professionals. Those are people who are kind of like an employee, except they call them a professional, a doctor, lawyer, accountant, whatever. And then we have the B and the I on the other side, big business and investing in your business. And he talks about why the E and the S, employment or solo professional, um, always have problems because they simply trade their time for dollars. And it goes away, and they have to redo it year after year after year after year and something else controls them all the time. He talks about why the B and the I are important because a big business allows you to duplicate yourself and you invest your time to have long-term income producing opportunities instead of just trading your time. I really encourage you to listen to any of the CDs you can get a hold of him or read any of his books. He's incredible. Kiyosaki says that the solution to this that answers all the questions we've been talking about tonight is a concept called network marketing. He says there's some key things you've got to put into this. Make sure you're using a proven business model. We're going to talk about that tonight. Make sure you're using high-quality guaranteed products. We're going to talk about that tonight. He says, talk about having an efficient marketing site that's online 24, 365. We're going to talk about the ability to build teams and networks with other ambitious entrepreneurs. And he said, it's the most effective opportunity to help people transition in and through a business. Now, here's how I would define network marketing. You see, we're so used to the employment situation that we only get paid for what we do. We never get paid for what other people do. And network marketing sets into a different mindset. This is what Kiyosaki talks about. You know, we don't get paid for the efforts of others. They don't work for us. We get paid for efforts that we jointly do together. So they're working with us. And the deal about this kind of business is that you help other people succeed so they can make a lot and you make a little. So it's the opposite of a pyramid. Well, I want them to make a lot, a lot, a lot, so I can make a lot, a lot, a lot of little. So the more you help people succeed, the more everybody wins along the way. The profound benefit of network marketing is that you aren't just part of someone else's network. You can build your own network of independent business owners. It's not a pyramid. You don't get paid because you're on top. You earn a little bit of the income when you help others make more, and those little bits add up a lot. So when you help a lot of other people succeed, then you succeed a lot too. That's the real power of the network. It gives you the ability to amplify yourself by duplicating yourself. I couldn't have done that as a construction worker. I can't duplicate myself as a construction worker. I can't duplicate myself as a surgeon. No other surgeon is going to share his income 
problem with me? Well, when you help somebody build a business of their own, then they're able to have a tremendous income that both parties benefit from. Network marketing empowers both parties to benefit. This is a powerful benefit for both people because it's such a drastic contrast to traditional business. Let, let's take a look. Let's compare traditional business to what happens in network marketing. Let's say in a traditional business concept, you generate $2,800 of, of profit for a company, okay? You did some work at your company it generated $2,800 of profit for that company. In fact, let's say that I'm the one who owns the company and you work for me. You're my employee, okay? And your work generated $2,800, okay? I'm your employer, but you did all the effort to generate $2,800. I didn't do the work. You did it all. I didn't even look over your shoulder. You did it all by yourself. You generated the $2,800. Now let's talk about how we're going to split that money. <laughs> How do you think we should split that money, okay? Do you think you should keep all of it, or should we share some of it? It's my company, so we're probably going to have to split it, right? How would you recommend we split it? 50-50? You guys probably think since you did all the work, you should get more than 50%, right? Are you, are you confused how this is going to end up? <laughs> You think you should get more than 50% because you did all the work, but, but that's not how regular business works. You know who keeps the majority of profit. The owner keeps the profit. Well, if I kept 2,000 of it and you kept 800 of it, you're not going to be motivated. You're going to be incredibly frustrated. Uh, if I'm taking home most of your profit, that's why you look forward to 5 o'clock instead of looking forward to staying late and making the business work better, right? When you get into network marketing, it flips 180 degrees. You can actually out-earn the people that helped you. You can actually out-earn your sponsors, your mentors, the people, quote-unquote, above you. But this isn't a pyramid because the guy on the bottom can make the most money. So you can actually pass your mentor and sponsor. It's the opposite of a pyramid. That's why we're always looking for the sharpest people out there that want the best they can get, and we can't wait for you to pass us. I'd like all of you to pass me. Tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock would be fine. We want to do everything we can. We're looking for A players who are sick and tired of being stuck in a B game. Because... <laughs> Because these are the kind of people that want to build their own teams. They want to build entire networks of entrepreneurs. The real power of network marketing is the ability to amplify yourself by duplicating yourself. I've never had anybody get mad at me about this. I've never had anybody mad saying, well, Greg, you helped me make 2000 and you made $800. I hate you, Greg. <laughs> I've never met anybody who understands math that little. <laughs> I'm, I'm making 2000 you're making 800 you're ripping me off. We travel all over the globe. We play golf at the world-class golf courses. We bury our toes in the sand at some of the greatest beaches in the world. And in the middle of it, they're not turning to me and say, I hate you, Greg. I hate you, Greg. You know, you're forcing this down our throat. Some people will say, I don't want to be in a business where I make money off all my friends. Really? Your friends would love to have friends like me. That's the best deal in the world. Everybody wins. Yeah. <laughs> now, amazingly, you're going to run into people who say, yeah, but, you know, I think it's wrong to make too much money. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like there's a moral code that you're only supposed to make so much there's a limit. It's so, so it's okay if you work your brains out. It's okay if you leave your family all day. But God forbid if you bring much more home than just to barely survive. Well, I'm sorry. I disagree with that. What in the world is wrong with helping others to succeed? And the more I help them succeed, the more we succeed. And the more we help them succeed, the more we earn. The more we, the more we help them do better, the better we do for our family. Our family doesn't prosper because we rip people off. Our family prospers because we help tens of thousands of families families prosper. Why shouldn't we prosper accordingly? You know, your mother taught you the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's why our family prospers beyond imagination, because we're prospering other families. We're doing unto them like we'd have them do unto us. And it's a real world application of the golden rule. Too often the golden rule of business is do unto others before they do unto you. Well, <laughs> how much fun is that? It's not fun to get stabbed in the back. It's not fun stabbing other people in the back. That, why would you want to do it? This is a unique business idea that says you succeed by helping others succeed first. And you know, as great as that is, and there's money in it. Here's the best part. You go to bed at night and you sleep well because everybody wins. Now, how often does that happen to you at work? Do you have a supervisor or a boss who says, well, look, let me, let me spend my time and my effort away from my family to help you pass me as soon as possible. Does that happen? You know, I, most people have never had that conversation. And, and uh, it's not because they're bad people. <laughs> it's not because your boss is a bad guy or your supervisor is a bad guy. And some of you are going, oh, yeah, they are. You haven't met them, Greg. <laughs> Well, I'm not a better person. I'm just in a different vehicle. I want you to pass me. I want you to know everything I can teach you, everything I know, and the sooner you know it, the better. The sooner you succeed, the better, because the more you succeed, the more my family's going to succeed. I just like a business that has the built-in golden opportunity into it. You know, the big key is that the most successful people will share the best that they have because they want you to succeed. They want you to pass them. Guys... What vehicle exists like that? that? That is just astounding to me. I will tell you this. 
I do, I do not think that you can match the lifestyle of the people in this business by people who will help you. I've had people say that, well, Greg, I know there's people that have a better lifestyle than people involved in network marketing. I know some people that have nicer homes than some of the people or some of the top people in network marketing. They have, they have nicer cars than some of the people in network marketing. They have a nicer income or a nicer lifestyle. Listen to me. No, you don't. There is not a person on this planet that has nicer homes than people in network marketing, nicer cars, nicer income, or nicer lifestyle, listen to me, that will share it with you and show you how to have the same thing at all. This is incredibly unique. Now, I'm a skeptical guy. I look at lots of businesses. I subscribe to dozens of different business journals, magazines, economic analysis papers, yet I've never seen anything that offers that kind of help. My computer monitors several thousand publications around the world every day, watches for keywords, looks out for businesses and financial stability, yet I have not found anything that will touch all these parameters of what network marketing does. Now, who wouldn't want to be involved in that? Now, when Kiyosaki talked about being involved in that, he said, you've got to make sure you're working with quality corporations. Well, we've got the most quality support system in the entire world. We work with Amway Corporation, and it stands out as the easiest decision of everything we've ever talked about tonight. It was the easiest. It is the number one largest direct selling business in the world. It's been around for over 50 years, over half a century, unbelievably financially powerful. Amway and its parent company company, UltraCore, paid over $40 billion in bonuses. Wow. You can get involved in all the cool stuff. I just soon get involved in stuff that makes sense. Yes. Wouldn't you? Absolutely. Woo. And Amway works with highest quality. We have partner stores with Apple and Best Buy and Disney and Bank of America. Uh, these are some of the e-commerce leaders in the world. Amway's got an unbelievably comprehensive website with product information, ordering, teaching, training, streaming videos, apps for mobile devices, and a personal touch. Don't send us an email if you have questions. We have live people that will talk to you 24 hours a day. We don't think emails are fun. We like talking to real people. We have a product line that's especially powerful. And you're not going to see us involved in some crazy, exotic, miracle drink or a pill or a cream or a magic machine. <laughs> We work with quality everyday products that everybody already needs, that everybody already buys, and they use anyway money on them. They spend money anyway. They're already doing these things anyway. It's the simplest concept in the world. And, and, and what's the magic of Amway? Here's the real magic that makes this all work. They have a guarantee for 180 days. All we ask is one thing. Will you try something else? Because we're going to get you. We have hundreds and hundreds of products that are exclusive and amazing. Look, we don't run the volume we do and not have the most phenomenal products we make. Maybe the first one you tried out wasn't for you. You're going to have something that you like so much, you're going to beg us never to run out of it. You're going to buy extras because it's so awesome. That's why Amway succeeds, because they believe so much in what they do, they make your business so simple it's ridiculous. We work with quality products like Neutralite. It's, it, it, is, it is the world's number one selling vitamin and dietary supplement brand in the world. Artistry, cosmetics, works with skincare and Cosmetics. It is among the world's top five largest selling premium skincare brands. And all these statistics and everything are from the Euro Monitor. I didn't make them up the other day. We sell home care products. Our first product was a laundry detergent. No, it's not sexy. It's not, you know, oh, that's the coolest product in the world. But guess what? Everybody uses it. Everybody needs it. They use it up and they buy it again and again and again. And it's one of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of products. You add up all those things every day. It's amazing how much money people spend on that kind of stuff. We have personal care items. We have, have Edible items, mobile edibles, we're all eating on the run today. we got the best nutrition company in the world. Why wouldn't we have food and drink to go? My gosh, we got quality and health and it tastes good. You, you can't get better than that. That's, I mean, everything just seems to fall together. Some of you are going, well, it's just too good to be true. Yeah, I ran into a guy like that once. I, uh, I met with my banker. I was very young in the business. I was 27 years old. We had had fast success, had great income, we hadn't had time to accumulate assets and reserves yet, so we were discussing a mortgage for our first home. First house we'd ever bought, and I remember sitting down in front of the banker. He was sitting behind his desk, had his nice little suit and his coat on. I had on jeans and a leather coat. <laughs> that wasn't on purpose. And um, <laughs> did I say that out loud? <laughs> so he looked at my income statements and said, wow. And I said, what, what's wrong? And he says, well, you made more money in one year than I'll ever make here in five years. And I said, well, what's wrong with that? And he said, well, nothing. I just can't believe you can do that. And I went, well, why not? He said, well, I've seen the business you're in, and, you know, you draw out how much money you can make and stuff like that. And I said, really, somebody showed this to you? He said, yeah. And I said, well, what did you think? And he said, I didn't believe it. I said, well, I did. <laughs> yeah. 
You know, despite all this, you're going to have people say, well, money's not the most important thing in life. You know, we are amazingly stubborn creatures, aren't we? <laughs> you know, people get defensive when we start talking about money. Some are trying to justify not being involved in a business or making money because they'll say, well, money's not the most important thing in life. I agree. I agree there are a lot of things way more important in life than money, and I'd love for you to discover what one or even two of those things are. <laughs> Unfortunately, when you're spending all day trying to make a living and survive, and you're going to work every day trading your dollars or hours for dollars, you don't have time to focus on the more important things. I find it humorous and ironic that most of the people making that claim that money is not the most important thing in their life are on their way out the door to go to their employer's place of business. That just seems a little hypocritical to me. Look, the lack of money is sadly making the majority of most people's decisions. Most people you know know exactly what they're going to be doing on Tuesday. They know when they're going to get up, what they're going to wear, what they're going to have for breakfast, when they're going to have breakfast, when and where they're going to drive right after that. Coincidentally, the same place everybody else in town is driving. All at the same time, it's amazing how people go, let's drive now. Just so you're <laughs> Ready, go. <laughs> I don't know if all the radio stations coordinate that or what. Start your engines. <laughs> I'd rather wake up on a Tuesday and have nothing scheduled and turn to Honey and say, what do you want to do today, Honey? She's not going to say, yeah, but you shovel horse manure. She's going to go, thank you for shoveling horse manure. <laughs> you know, I, I, I think money is like air. Um, you know, we have lots of air. You never think about it, right? You never have to think about it. If you've got plenty of something, you don't think about it. You know, you don't brag about, look how much air I have. Who cares? <laughs> You don't wake up in the middle of the night. Am I breathing? I don't know if we've got enough air here. You know, you don't even think about it. You breathe unconsciously. You know, but if you hold your breath or somebody blocks your airway, you're going to think about air a lot. When you're restricted, you think about it all the time. Well, money's the same way. You've got plenty of it, but you don't think about it. You don't worry about it. When you don't have enough money, it's all you can ever focus on. It's like you're constantly gasping for a gulp of cash. And the purpose of having abundant money is not so you can say, look how much money I have. It's not to stack it up in your living room and say, my pile is bigger than your pile. The point is when you have an abundance of it, you don't have to think about it anymore. Most people don't have an abundance of it. They're pinched, and you deserve better than that. Your family deserves better than that. You deserve to do something better in your life, so demand some financial freedom. Freedom, demand financial instability so you can start deciding and focusing on the things that matter rather than thinking about stupid money all the time. Now, some people misinterpret this and say, because I'm talking about money, they think I'm materialistic. Say, well, I don't want to be materialistic, Greg. Do you hear yourself? Do you hear how hypocritical this is? You have so little concern for anybody else in your family, let alone society, that the only thing you can think about is you. The only thing your imagination and creativity can come up with is to buy materialistic trinkets. That is sad. But if you know there are people crying and in need every single day in our society, in your community, in your families, then you realize there are great things you can do. You can think of many more things than just stupid materialistic trinkets. And I pray for you. I pray you will become hog-stinking rich because we need people more like you, people who care about other people and have, have gone and built extra so they can share it with other people. I am not ashamed of financial success. I don't mind having materialistic things that work. I like cars that actually work. I, I want a nice car that works, you know, because things can go wrong. You know, you've seen the bumper sticker. You know, stuff happens. <laughs> In our family, we think you ought to have extra cars. You ought to have one more car than you have people that have driver's licenses. So if something happens to a car, then you can drive a different one while that one's getting repaired. Some people, they live on the cutting edge. They're always struggling. You know, their car has 15 things wrong with it. It still runs. Wow. <laughs> and then your water pump goes out. They cancel everything for the next four days. They're focusing on a $70 water pump. I'm going to go down to the junkyard so they can take one out of a thing. Man, I saved a lot of money. And they jack up their car in their driveway and install their water pump. You know, th th that's what your life is worth? A $70 water pump? Hey, I say send your maintenance, man. Take care of your water pump while you drive your other car, for goodness sakes. Move on and enjoy your life. Don't let a water pump run your life. Who's materialistic here? Some guy who spends four days on a water pump? It's a material thing. That's materialism. Don't be materialistic. Love your family. Spend time with your family. Stop being materialistic and letting a $70 water pump run your life. You know, you look at the world today, and, and it's changing fast. You, know, you look at the, the young people of today. They're surrounded by technology. This youngest generation is amazing. They get it. They understand. 
hand, that they don't need to be in a cubicle. They've got devices in their hand that they could run the world from the palm of their hand. They could work any hours of the day they want. They can choose if it's a nice day to go out and play and spend time with their kids and their friends and do whatever they want to. They want to operate a business of their own from the palm of their hand when they want, doing what they want when they want, and they turn around and go apply for being employed by someone else. And I'm thinking, are you thinking through what you're doing? Because here's my question. Who is offering you that job? What company is saying to you, you don't have to show up, just run it off your, your palm device, you can do whatever you want to, when you want to, whenever you think of doing it, you know, work at your own pace. No company is offering that. I've never seen a company off, offer that. You can run this business off of any mobile device you want, and you choose when. We don't take attendance or anything else. You get to do what you want, when you want to. I have never met anybody who is looking for Amway. But I've met a lot of people who found everything they were looking for when they finally found Amway. So you can't have different results repeating what didn't work before. You've got to be willing to look at something different. You've got to change your mindset. You have to focus on what you want as an end result. And you've got to insist on the destination of the path, not the path. Too many people saying, well, I want a different ending, but I've got to go down this road. You know, Henry Ford was one of the most brilliant people in the world when he said this. He said, if I had asked people what they want, they would have said faster horses. He said what they really wanted is to get to their destination faster, but they were trying to dictate to me how I would get there. He says, you really want a faster horse or you just want to get someplace faster? And they go, well, what are you talking about? He says, let me solve that. Is the point that you want to arrive sooner? He said, yeah. So he means he could change an entire vehicle. It would involve changing all the things around vehicles, roads, gas stations, and all the people who don't want to change found fault. Well, those cars are loud and they're smelly and they scare the horses when they drive by. Yeah? Well, who won? <laughs> <laughs> Try riding a horse down a freeway? You will die. If you are not getting where you want to go, maybe you need to look at a new vehicle. You can't keep flogging the same old horse that isn't going anywhere, okay? Wow. You know, another point that Robert Kiyosaki talked about was making sure you're associating yourself with a mentor training group, and that is the critical key to our network business working. For network marketing to work correctly, you've got to have mentorship and training, and we have just got the premium, most superb group in the world with a team of successful, independent business owners. Um, this is made up of people who have actually succeeded. They're building their own success, and they're helping others. The people that train in our business are not people that took a three-week course who've never actually done what they teach and write books about how other people did it. These are real people who really did it. And we have monthly coaching and teaching in dozens of major cities throughout the North American continent. It's a dream team. Name me an industry that does that, that assembles the top performers, they teach you the best secrets, and their goal is for everybody to pass them. They'd like to see everybody do better than they did. Imagine that. Amazing. You know, I, I run into people all the time who, who listen to a presentation of this, and they'll sit there all night with folded arms, and you can tell that they're just struggling with something. And I love to go up, up to them afterwards and, and meet them and talk to them and say, look, I want you to understand something. You were paying attention tonight, and obviously you have something else on your mind. You know, I'm allowed to quit this. I could do what you do. Would you recommend that? <laughs> now, now, the guy may struggle with the answer, but his wife standing next to him, women are very sharp. And she usually goes, oh, no, you don't want to do what he does, trust me. <laughs> I'm not sure how the ride home went, but uh, I, I find this. So, so don't let this slip by. Guys, complacency is so easy. Look, don't worry about us, okay? We're going to be just fine. My Cocoa Krispies are going to be just fine tomorrow morning, whether or not you get involved. That's fine. And you can decide to pass on this. Look, Amway's growing like they've never grown around the world. They are going to continue to grow. Whether you get involved or not, I want you to know Amway's not on hold tonight sitting by the phone waiting for your decision, okay? <laughs> you can decide to do what you want to do, but guys, I'll tell you what, you treat life and goals casually and you will be a casualty. And you don't want to do that when an when a, when a opportunity like this is, is staring you in the face. If one-tenth of what I tell you is true tonight, you are foolish not to check this out. You are foolish not to aggressively find out for sure. If I'm wrong, this has cost you nothing. If I'm right, it will profit you everything. You've got to ask some tough questions. Ask your friends tough questions. Ask anybody and everybody you respect as many questions as you want. Just keep it in perspective. As you're analyzing this interior part, if your friends are highly successful, ask them questions. I'm looking for people who have built their own success, not inherited it, not that wish they were successful, that are really successful. You're going to find the only people that struggle with anything I'm talking about are people that typically are struggling in their own life financially. We'll just ask them to see the U-Ink balance sheet and you won't be confused anymore. 
You know, one of the sources of information I encourage you to get is go to the Internet. I love the Internet. I love that we have the advances we have in society and you can do the things you can. There are mountains of true stories and facts that amplify all the positives I'm talking about on the Internet. But just make sure you understand how to work the Internet. In fact, when I talk to people, I say, look, pull out your cell phone and before you leave, let's, let's look up Amway on the Internet and let's make sure we can get all the information we can. In fact, let's stack the deck against Amway. Let's search for Amway is bad. Now, most people think they know how to use the Internet because, you know, they've shared pictures of their kitten and things like that and, <laughs> and constructive things. But, but most people have never really used the Internet to look at businesses before. So if you will look up Amway is bad, I just did this the other day, you'll find over 2 million matches and people go, oh, my gosh, there's a lot of negative on the Internet about Amway. Have you ever used the Internet before? <laughs> I mean, I think you're missing a point here. Um, there's a lot of people with nothing to do and, and uh, just like to sit and type negative stuff all the time. I mean, here, here's your proof. Let's search for Mother Teresa is bad. You don't have to be Catholic and you got to like that woman. Come on. How can you? Hey, she beats us. She has 11 million negative matches. Wow. Look up Walmart is bad, 108 million ma matches. Look up democracy is bad, 137 million matches. Look up the United States is bad, 1.2 billion matches. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. You don't have the courage to do this. Look up jobs are bad. <laughs> I mean, if we're going to be honest, 1.4 billion matches. So if internet negative makes your life decisions, here's what you need to do. Never follow the teachings of Mother Teresa, leave democracy, quit your job, and get involved with Amway as soon as you can. <laughs> if you're going to research the internet, here's the questions you've got to ask. Is what I'm reading truthful and valid? I have found that all negative that ever exists about network marketing, about Robert Kiyosaki, about Amway, or any of the people that are involved in this are typically misinformed or misrepresented. Some guy may say, well, I had a bad experience. Well, I had a bad experience with a plumber before, too. But it doesn't mean plumbing is the worst profession in the entire world. Okay? I mean, for goodness sakes, um, you know, there's IBOs in the world, independent business owners who work with Amway Corporation. They are not all perfect. You know, for goodness sakes, I, I don't apologize that people are free to be who they want and they, we don't, they don't work for us. We don't control them. We don't tell them what to do. I would tell you that some of them do some things that are dumb and stupid, and we don't condone misconduct in this business whatsoever. But you have to ask the question, okay, I experienced something. Well, is that what we teach? Is that what Amway teaches? Or was that some errant person misbehaving? If they're misbehaving, then hold them accountable. But don't hold us accountable. This company has the most um, high levels of character and honesty and forthrightness, then I don't think you'll find that anywhere else like you'll find it here. I am not excited about Anaway because it's perfect. I'm excited because the other options are a lot farther from perfect, and given the options I have, it's the best thing I've ever found. So let's go back to the Jim Collins question. 200 million in the bank, five years to live, what would you change? If the answer you'd change almost everything, what the heck are you doing? This business can give you more choices, more chances to do what you want to do with your life than any other vehicle you'll ever have. You won't succeed the first day. This, this is simple, but it's not easy. And you won't go without making some mistakes. Just stay focused and continue to ask your question if it's a bad day compared to what? A bad day compared to another option? Jim Collins asked you that question, and if your answer is that you would change everything in your life, then this is the final question I have for you tonight. How long are you going to wait to live the life you want and deserve rather than the life that you've been forced to live? Because one day, your life will flash before your eyes. Make sure it's worth watching. Thank you. Tech